In the moot court of the Gale Cup 2011 and on appeal from the Supreme Court of Canada, Her Majesty the Queen versus uh, Morelli. Uh, our first counsel for the appellant, I believe, is Alex Boland. Please proceed. Members of the court, this case is about the ability of the criminal justice system to effectively investigate and prosecute child pornography offenses. In the absence of a finding of bad faith or of negligence, appellate courts ought to be slow in overturning warrants unless there is truly no credible or reliable evidence such that any court could issue the warrant. What was the main evidence here for the uh, warrant that made it probable gave you the grounds. There are a few key pieces for the Crown here. The chief piece of evidence is the existence of two icons or links that led to child pornography websites. Additionally, the chief witness observed- Do you say that uh, those links themselves could constitute uh, possession of child pornography? Uh, I would not argue that these links themselves represent possession of child pornography. What the links allow us to do is make a reasonable inference that at some point in the past, the respondent had visited these sites, had looked at the pictures that were on them, and had had, had these pictures on his screen. And that is at the point where possession is occurring. Once the pictures are on his screen, he had the ability to download them or store them, to print them or email them. In other words, he had control over the pictures when they were on his screen. So the links merely act as a way of inferring what he had done in the past. Well, does that mean that when I watch television and I have my PVR on so that um, I'm recording it, I guess that means I have possession. What if I'm not recording it, but I think it has a little gadget where you can sort of press a button and all of a sudden it's on hold and it's, it's staying there in time. I mean, do I have that much control just by pressing a few buttons that may or may not do things I don't understand? There is indeed a wide range of control that a person can uh, exercise on a given item or um, image, for example. However, in the context of the internet and of a home computer, the ability, the amount of control is quite extensive and quite obvious. It's, when a person does have this picture on their screen, they do have these wide range of activities they can do with it. Uh, well, is your position, I just want to be clear on your position, that any time a picture comes on the screen, you have control of it. You, providing that you do have the ability to do these other activities with it, you do have sufficient control to make out constructive possession. That is my submission. So uh, it, it, I'm not clear on your position. You seem to be saying that more is required than the image on the screen, that you have to have more things. Uh, that's quite correct. In order to have this possession, the, the, you have to have this element of control. So, for example, if you're merely watching TV without an ability to record it, you wouldn't have that same amount of control. Or if you're walking down the street and see an image of child pornography, and perhaps across the street, you can view it, but you don't have this control. And so so is not. control the recording? Control is the ability to determine the fate of the item in question. It's the ability to decide what you're going to do with it. Recording is one way a person might ex exercise that control. But the, the so anything you can do with it. So I, I open an icon, I open a, a, uh, something on my computer. It says Smith & Co. And a pornographic image comes up. I immediately shut it down. Uh, but I have controlled it. You say I am guilty of an offense. Uh, I would contend that you are indeed in possession of it, but you're not in criminal possession of it because there's a common law defense available, the defense of innocent possession. This defense operates where a person has come into possession of an illegal item, but has done so without that criminal intent. So you've gotten this image into your possession, but you've immediately divested yourself of it. Therefore, you're in possession, but not criminal possession. The analogy is to a person who walks down the street, finds a bag and picks it up, not knowing its contents. When they open it, they realize it's full of drugs. At this point, they immediately throw it away, or perhaps bring it to the police. That person has also come into possession, but not criminal possession. But why is it different if you've opened the, if you somehow see it, you, you see it, but you don't take the 
the, uh, the positive step of deleting it or turning it off, but you also don't save it. So it's just passed through and you haven't done anything to control it. In the context of a person who is browsing an internet site, they have done something to bring that onto their screen. Presumably they have clicked on a link or an image to put it onto their screen. So they're not quite in the same possession, position as a person who comes on something haphazardly. So they have this, uh, this additional action they've done to put themselves in this situation. Um, they're not the kind of person that has you know, accidentally arrived at this place. I, I wonder, in this present case, I believe that um, um, the uh, computer had been reformatted and it was uh, to the policeman's knowledge that therefore those icons had disappeared. Uh, they were no longer there. I mean, wasn't it uh, too late? Uh, uh, they were no longer there. They were not to be found there. They were, can you go back into the past to try and fish out evidence for something that may or may not have happened in the past? And then doesn't it make it uh, purely a coincidence that uh, due to the warrant, you find something in the future. I mean, is, uh, is it allowable for the state to sort of entrap its citizens in this manner? I would not characterize it as entrapment. Uh, essentially, we have two requirements here as the Crown. First, that an offense has been committed, which we have established by showing that it is a reasonable inference to assume the respondent had viewed child pornography and therefore come into possession of it. Second, we must show, as you point out, that we must show reasonable grounds to believe evidence will be found at the place of search. Here we do have evidence to this point, and my colleague will talk about this at length, but it's worth pointing out that there is evidence in the form of police testimony and expert testimony that uh, contained in the ITO, that evidence of this offense would be found at the place of search because the respondent would be the type of person to download this Im these images or access them again. Further, there is the possibility of a forensic analysis which might recover deleted files from the computer. One so, of the points your opponents make is that there really wasn't any expert evidence, or at least on the ITO, uh, there was no way for the judge to know whether there was any expert evidence. There was a statement uh, that uh, the deponent had talked to a colleague who said these type of people are likely to store. Uh, this kind of material. Um, how is that different than saying, well, this, a, a person has committed fraud in the past, he's now clear, but these type of people are likely to commit fraud again, and uh, therefore we have the right to search their computer. Isn't, uh, go ahead. My first submission would be that According to the moot court of Gail Cuff, which ruled today that new evidence would be introduced at this proceeding, there was expert testimony in the ITO itself. The ITO referred to the evidence of an expert uh, who said that Morelli did have the characteristics of a child pornography offender. So we're not merely relying on the evidence of the police officers, but also this expert. Further, as my colleague will explain, there is a powerful inference here that a person who has once viewed child pornography and has created a homepage to child pornography, and has created links to that child pornography, has a clear interest in it. And this kind of person might likely be the type of person to download child pornography or otherwise come into possession of child pornography in the future. But, uh, you know, I mean, that's typecasting, that's supplying stereotypes, that's uh, replacing uh, reasonable grounds by something entirely new. I would point out that indeed this is reasonable grounds and not beyond a reasonable doubt. This is not the same sort of situation we have when we're introducing uh, true propensity evidence or true expert testimony. We're simply looking for reasonable grounds. Here there is a bare minimum, but that bare minimum is met both by the expert witness and by the police officers. But isn't it circular? I mean the, the expert witness mm -hmm. testified at the voir dire that Morelli had the characteristics of a child uh, pornography offender, but how do we know that if, we, if we're assuming all of the facts in the ITO in order to get him to have those characteristics, are we not? Uh, there is some element of that, but however, it's important to keep in mind that once we've established that he has 
accessed these websites before. He has viewed this child pornography, and he has come into possession of it. We don't need the expert evidence to find him to be of a type, the type that consumes child pornography. We're not re therefore relying on the expert evidence to situate Mr. Morelli into that class. We've already accepted that he is of that class by the evidence of these links that show he has viewed this child pornography. So the expert evidence is then used to show evidence will be found at the place of search and not that the respondent himself is a child pornography offender. Can you save something as a favorite without actually looking at it? It's possible, but it would be uh, difficult to understand why a person would do so. And it's unclear uh, why a person would do so or what the point would be. If for one the future. Well, maybe for the, for the future, but would not have committed any offense so far. That's a possibility, but again, we're looking at reasonable grounds here at the warranting stage. It's certainly a reasonable inference to assume that a person who has created a link to something has been to that site, appreciated its contents, and wants to return to it. <clears throat> You have about four minutes left. Uh, perhaps we could uh, hear from you uh, as to any remaining points you might wish to make. Uh, if it pleases the court, I'd like to make some submissions on the issuing of the accessing offense. The accessing offense has been, it has been suggested that the accessing offense was the only correct offense that could have been put into the ITO based on these facts. This is the finding of the court below. I submit that the existence of these favorite links and this homepage allows the inference that the respondent had viewed child pornography. When he viewed it, he had both committed the offense of accessing and the offense of possession, and therefore both offenses could have been included in the ITO. If it was, uh, if, if as you suggest, uh, viewing a picture in a situation where you can control it somehow, is possession. Why did Parliament find it necessary to enact a further offense of accessing? Parliament wanted to be sure that all ways that a person could use child pornography are criminalized. Parliament sees a grave harm in child pornography and wanted to be sure that no one could escape liability through a careful parsing of statute. Did not the minister herself say that there were particular hurdles to defining possession and that therefore she wanted to introduce the offense of accessing which would not present those hurdles, yet your submission seems to equate the two. I, I have two submissions on that point. First, the Justice Minister stated that the accessing offense was intended to apply in situations where possession could not be made out because there was an absence of control. This is not the situation we're in today. In this case, there is an abundance of control. Second, there is still a space for accessing. Accessing will be the only appropriate offense wherever there is a case where a person has viewed child pornography but without that control. In that case, only accessing could apply and possession could not. For example, if there are a group of people in a movie theater watching child pornography on the screen, all of them have viewed this material, but none of them have come into possession of it because none of them can control the images on the screen. There, accessing would be the only applicable offense, never possession. Thank you. As a preface to my colleagues' arguments, I will make some brief submissions on the issue of the standard of review. This is important to keep in mind when we're looking at her argument, which is whether there were reasonable grounds to believe evidence of the offense would be found at the place of search. The appropriate standard of review is clearly set out in Araujo and Garofoli, and it is whether the ITO contains any credible and reliable evidence which can be relied upon such that any justice acting judicially could reasonably authorize the warrant, even if the, court, the reviewing court itself would not have issued it in the authorizing judge's place. In doing so, this court must look to the whole of the evidence, the totality of the circumstances, in order to assess whether reasonable grounds were made out. Pieces of evidence which on their own might be no more than suspicious can, when considered with the whole of the evidence, help amount to reasonable grounds. Can I just go back to your possession? Are, are, are you saying that had the police gone in on the warrant and found absolutely nothing, they could still charge uh, Mr. Morelli with possession based on the information in the ITO? It is possible. There may be a prima facie case, certainly not beyond a reasonable doubt. However, it's also important to remember there are other elements. 
the Crown would have to prove that he knowingly, that he knew of the content of the child pornography and so on. But it is not inconceivable that under similar facts where there was clear evidence that a person had viewed child pornography, the offense of possession could apply in that scenario. Thank you. To summarize, in this case, if we'll I give, could, you may summarize, yes. In this case, it was appropriate to issue a warrant on the basis of the offense of possession because the evidence showed the respondent had likely viewed child pornography, and when he did so, he came into possession of it. When assessing whether reasonable grounds existed to believe that evidence of this offense will be found at the place of search, this court should remember the standard is whether any court acting judicially could find reasonable grounds existed to search. Those are my submissions. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. McKinnon. Members of the court, I will address two issues. First, that the ITO was sufficient to authorize a search of the respondent's computer and his Section 8 rights were thus not breached. And second, that the evidence was correctly admitted at trial and should not be excluded under Section 24.2 of the Charter. This court should be cautious not to parse the ITO. Considering the totality of the circumstances, the two links to child pornography web pages, the home page set to a child pornography web page, the web camera, and the sudden and complete deletion of the computer, we cannot say that we are left with no basis on which the authorizing justice of the peace could reasonably have issued the warrant. Mr. Hunjet saw on the respondent's computer two links to child pornography that were marked as favorites. He also saw a home page that was set to a child pornography website. This is clear evidence that the respondent had viewed child pornography. My co-counsel has explained why in the appellant submission, this is sufficient to establish that the respondent was likely in possession of child <coughs> pornography. On the question of whether evidence would be found in the place to be searched, there was a four-month delay in between when Mr. Hunjet saw those, that evidence in the respondent's home and when the warrant was issued. The evidence of the police officers that the, that information would remain inside the computer and could be retrieved through forensic analysis is sufficient to provide that evidence would be found in the place to be searched. But aren't you sort of saying, especially based on your new expert evidence, that time doesn't really matter here because this is the type of person who's going to be committing this offense. So we can just go in any old day and probably we're going to catch him in the act. Is that good enough? We could probably imagine a circumstance where the time delay might have a greater impact on the reasonableness of that inference. However, in this circumstance, the four-month delay was not so lengthy that it was no longer reasonable to believe that evidence would be found in the place to be searched. On the evidence of the police officer, a forensic analysis would retrieve evidence that had been er erased in the formatting of the computer. So the pornographic homepage that the, uh, Mr. Hunjet saw and the two links to child pornography could be retrieved through forensic analysis. The concern here, as was addressed by the court, is that there was not sufficient detail provided in the ITO as to the police officer's expertise. However, the ITO stated the places of employment of the police officers in specialized units. This was sufficient to enable the justice of the peace to assess how much weight should be given to that evidence. Furthermore, the use of forensic methods to recover material deleted from a computer is not unusual, and we can have some confidence that the justice of the peace would have knowledge of that. However, even if we cannot rely on forensic analysis, the evidence of the police officers and of the additional expert as the typical behaviors of child pornographers child pornography consumers indicate that evidence would continue to be found in the place to be searched even without forensic analysis as this court has addressed. This is the theory, once a criminal, always a criminal. So on that basis, once a person's been convicted of the, a crime, even after she or he has served their uh, sentence, we should be able to go to a judge and say we want a warrant for the arrest because we believe that typically a person who has committed this type of crime will be committing another crime. Not a warrant for the arrest, pardon me, a warrant for search. Uh, isn't there something wrong with that kind of reasoning uh, when we think about citizens' rights to privacy? And privacy of what's on your computer is quite important to many citizens. 
the appellant would submit that the evidence in this case does not go that far. The respondent was not actually committed an offence and did not serve time, as in the example you provided. Perhaps you'd like to answer the question. It has to do with privacy and the values that are challenged, perhaps, and of course I await your answer, by uh, the reasoning that this person is probably a criminal, therefore he's likely to conti be continuing to be a criminal, therefore we can get a search warrant to prove he's a criminal. The principle of privacy is certainly critical and underlies the entire warrant process. The concern you express is with the use of propensity evidence in ITOs, the extent to which we can draw conclusions and rely on the typical behavior in order to get a warrant to search someone's house for evidence of an offense. In situations such as this, where we have clear evidence that someone has viewed child pornography, Relying on the additional evidence of police officers that those who view child pornography typically also download it does not go so far as to say that once a criminal, always a criminal. In this narrow circumstance, when we have evidence that somebody has an interest in child pornography, likes to view those images, has marked those websites as favorites, in the, uh, the experience of police officers, that person will probably also have downloaded that evidence. To draw a line after when Mr. Hunjet saw the links and when the respondent deleted his computer and to say that for some reason the respondent's conduct would have changed after that point is without evidence. So in the appellant's submission, it is reasonable to rely on the police officer's opinions that there would there's reasonable grounds to believe that the respondent would have downloaded that information. I believe the answer to my question is that you have no concerns about privacy. You, you agree that the reasoning is essentially we think he must have committed a criminal act by inference and people who do that kind of thing are likely to continue and so therefore we should be able to search their computers four or five months after. Uh, that's the reasoning. I think you agree. The appellant has... And, Yes, sorry. The appellant has significant concerns about privacy. If there was no information no, in the ITO at all as, on which we could base this conclusion, then that certainly would not be sufficient to authorize a search of the respondent's home. However, in this circumstance where we do have evidence that the respondent had viewed those websites, including a pornographic a, a web page of child pornography that was displayed on the computer screen when Mr. Hunjet went into the home, this is sufficient to provide that credibly based probability that allows the state to infringe the privacy interest of an individual. Thank you. Do you concede that it's the totality of the circumstances here? Uh, or, because you seem to be very much relying on the fact that the Lolita website was, was a favorite or was on the home page. And I'm, I'm looking specifically at the presence of the young child how much weight do you put on that? Is that, one, is that a brick that is necessary in this confluence of factors or not? In this case, the appellant does not submit that that information uh, is necessary to establish that the respondent was likely in possession of child pornography. That information was included in the ITO in order to explain the delay in between Mr. Hunjet's visit to the <coughs> respondent's home and the issuance of the search warrant. <coughs> So the information about the child and the web camera explains why Mr. Hunjet went to social services before going to the RCMP. It was included, in essence, in order to make full and frank disclosure, as was found by the trial judge of the voir dire. Still, from the moment you know that the computer has been reformatted and that things no longer stand as they were when uh, the witness saw them, uh, isn't it the equivalent of um, uh, transforming mere speculation uh, based on, a, on a, a concept of that type of offender uh, rather than reasonable grounds? The evidence in the ITO from the police officer who worked in a technological crime unit that information will remain inside a computer and can be retrieved after it has been formatted goes to address that point. Despite the four month delay, forensic analysis can be capable of retrieving that information from the computer. 
And that's why that information was included in the ITO and why the investigating officer consulted this individual from the Technological Crime Unit. So in this circumstance, it was not mere speculation that a forensic analysis would likely be successful. It was not a certainty, but that is not the standard to be applied here. The question is whether it was reasonable, whether there was a credibly based probability that evidence would be found in the place of the search. If, however, this court finds that the ITO was insufficient and the respondent's Section 8 charter rights were breached, the appellant submits that the evidence should nevertheless be admitted and not excluded under Section 24.2 of the Charter. I will focus on the first factor under the uh, framework identified in the Queen and Grant in addressing this question, as the appellant acknowledges that the second factor under Grant weighs in favor of exclusion of the evidence as the privacy interest in a personal computer is high. And the third factor under the Queen and Grant, society's interest in the adjudication of the case on its merits, clearly weighs in favor of admission of the evidence. The seriousness of the charter infringing conduct in this case cannot be characterized as high. The trial judge found that the affiant made full and frank disclosure. Implicit in this finding is that the affiant was not negligent in his duties. There was no finding of bad faith or of negligence by the trial judge. This places the conduct of the affiant in the case at the low end of the spectrum. Any omissions from the ITO relate largely to the surrounding circumstances and not to the core of the ITO. There was clear evidence that the respondent had viewed child pornography as it was displayed on his screen when Mr. Hunjat went to his home. I'm sorry, it wasn't child pornography that was displayed on the screen, it was an icon that he, that he could click on. But there was no actual image. Um, with respect, uh, uh, in the new evidence admitted by the moot court of the Gale Cup, on the date of Hunjet's first visit, Morelli's homepage was set to Lolita porn. Thus, there was an image of child pornography that was viewed by Mr. Hunjet. This clear evidence as to- Do we know that or is it just say Lolita porn? It on could the, just be the title page or whatever. On the, the appellant submission that um, when one views favorites, it requires opening the browser, and the function of opening the browser is to display the home page. And thus, to say that Morelli's home page was set to Lolita Porn website indicates that what he saw was a home page of the website. Based on the record before us, it is the appellant's interpretation that it was the actual website that was viewed by Mr. Hunjet. This evidence- Might have to charge him with access. And the appellant concurs that the evidence in this case would support the offense of accessing child pornography. I mean, Mr. Hunjet. <laughs> and certainly the defense of innocent possession would be equally available to Mr. Hunjet. On the facts, thus, there is clear evidence that the respondent accessed child pornography. Thus, the specification of the offense of possession of child pornography in the ITO, rather than the offense of accessing child pornography, is the type of technicality that should not be used to exclude the evidence in the balancing of the factors under the Queen and Grant. There was clear evidence that the respondent had committed the offense of accessing child pornography, and the evidence of the police officers combined with the independent expert, provided details as to the link between this evidence and the likelihood that evidence would remain at the place of the search. There was no grounds on which to find that the affion was careless, and thus his conduct in this case is at the low end of the spectrum, and in the appellant's submission, this factor weighs in favor of admission of the evidence. You call it the low end of the spectrum, but Justice Fish said at paragraph 142, the repute of the administration of justice is jeopardized by judicial indifference to unacceptable police conduct. It is the appellant's submission that the factors under Grant identify that there is a balancing that must take place. While the court below characterized the ITO, uh, the conduct of the affiant as being on the higher end of the spectrum, 
the appellant submits that that uh, was based on an interpretation of the ITO that does not accord with the behavior of the affiant. The affiant in this case did make full and frank disclosure. He went to efforts to obtain evidence that the evidence would remain in the place to be searched. He contacted those additional police officers. He gained the evidence of this expert, of this independent expert, and he included all of this in the ITO in order to attempt to provide uh, the fullest picture possible that there was reasonable grounds to believe that the evidence would be found in the place of the search. As found by the trial judge, he made full and frank disclosure. That finding is owed deference by this court. And in these circumstances, his conduct is on the lower end of the spectrum. The principle underlying this factor asks about the blameworthiness of the police conduct and the degree to which the court needs to separate itself in order to indicate that, in order to separate itself from this type of police misconduct. In this case, the court need not be concerned about a need to separate itself, as the uh, affiant's conduct was a, a, an effort to present full and frank disclosure and any errors or omissions did not go to the heart of the ITO, but only the periphery. In conclusion, in this case, what we are left with is an independent citizen who saw, I see my time has elapsed, if I may have a minute to yes, conclude. Yes, of course. What we have is an independent citizen who saw worrying circumstances in the respondent's home. He reported his concerns to the police, the police investigated, and they found evidence of possession of child pornography. And there is nothing in the ITO which should lead this court to overturn the respondent's conviction. Those are my submissions. Thank you very much. The court will rise for five minutes.